For the rest of the uh, course, we are actually going to be looking at signals and systems in the what we call the frequency domain. So we've been looking at things in the time domain up until this point. Um, so for the first part of that, we are going to concentrate on taking a look at signals in the frequency domain, just like we did in the time domain. We looked at signals and transformations first, and then we will continue on to systems in a couple weeks. Now before we even look at signals in the frequency domain, I just want to step back a bit and think about things conceptually and um, what we mean when we're talking about signal approximation, which we've already done and you've already done in the past. Just want to put it in some context. So before we even talk about signals, I want to talk about an analogy first. And uh, you've certainly been doing this since high school. Um, if we think of some vector f, we can decompose that vector into its subsequent components. So it might have an x component, a y component, and a z component. And how do we find those components? Well, we do a projection. So um, these values are uh, f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z. The, the uh, scalar values are just numbers that scale the unit vectors ax, ay, and az. And we can also approximate this vector by dropping some of the good, uh, components. So for instance, if we drop the z component, we could say that f subscript xy is a reasonable approximation to f in some sense. But how good is that approximation? Can we actually quantify that? Well, we can do the same thing with signals. So let's say we have a signal f of t. We have already talked about approximating it with a number of impulses. And each of those impulses would have an amplitude equal to the value of the function at that point. Um, we'll call it f of tn. And so if we wanted to write out what this uh, function is as a, um, in a graphical sense and how we're approximating it, it's basically one function plus a second function plus a third function, etc. And we can add those up to recreate an approximation to f of t. Now, in the limit, when those impulses get infinitely close together, then that sum has to become an integral. But we could also take that infinite, infinite sum and we could terminate it. So let's, I guess I shouldn't have minus infinity here, but that's okay. Um, we could terminate it at some value capital N. And at, at that point, we have some approximation to f of t. But we are not restricted to just using uh, impulse functions to approximate f of t. So for instance, we could use polynomials. So if we take a look at the first couple terms in that series, um, the first term is a constant. The second term is a straight line. And the third term is a parabola, etc. And uh, we have some constants, a0, a1, a2, which tell us how much of those individual components we use to rebuild f of t. If I truncate that series at n equals 1, then I have a straight line fit to f of t. And if I terminate, it, uh, terminate that series or that sum at n, then I have an nth degree polynomial approximation to f of t. And you've done this before, probably in the context of fitting straight lines to data or fitting parabolas to data and you're trying to find the best fit. But if we take a step back, there's no reason why we need to use impulse functions. There's no reason that we need to use polynomials. We could really use any function. And I'm just going to call those functions phi. And so, for instance, we might have one shape like this, another shape like this, another shape like this, and we're just taking scaled versions of those to create f of t. So these constants tell us what the uh, scaling value is. 
So if I terminate that uh, series at n equals 1, then I'm just taking the first two terms. If I terminate it at n, then I've got an approximation um, using the first n terms of these functions phi, whatever they might be. So let's go back to the idea of vectors for a second. So we know that we can decompose f into a bunch of components and we find those components by doing a projection. Well, what do we do with signals? So let's say we have f of t, the red curve, and we have f1, f2, f3, which are our um, functions that we want to decompose it with. I guess I should call those phi1, phi2, phi3. So how do I best choose those constants um, so that my approximation is the best it can possibly be? So let's take a look at this from the perspective of information. So if I have a system, and it doesn't have to be a person, it could be a uh, part of a computer is sending information to another part of a computer. Um, but at the end of the day, what's happening is the sender is trying to send a signal from um, some point in space or uh, over to the receiver. And it's going through some channel, and that channel could be a wire, it could be a whole bunch of different systems, it might be through the air, uh, might be through fiber optic cable. If we have chosen to decompose our input signal, so with either impulses or um, polynomials or whatever basis functions uh, we want to use, then the receiver can perfectly reconstruct that signal if they know, first off, what basis functions were being used, so we have to be on the same page, and then if I send them every coefficient in the expansion, then the receiver can perfectly reconstruct that signal x of t. But at the end of the day, it's just the coefficients that I need to send them, and they need to know the basis functions. And if, uh, if I want to have perfect reconstruction, I need to send an infinite number of coefficients, which means an infinite amount of information. Okay, so uh, for instance, we could have used impulse functions, we might use polynomials, we might use some arbitrary basis functions, but at the end of the day, all we need to send are the values of these coefficients. Practically speaking, we can't send infinite information. We truncate it at some point. So if we create an approximate reconstruction of the message, we still need to know what basis functions are we talking about and what coefficients are we using up to order n. And that gives us an approximation. But now it is a finite amount of information. So this is where we start to think about the engineering perspective is, okay, well how many coefficients do I need to have a reasonable approximation? And then that brings us back to, okay, well, what does reasonable mean? So how do I get a good approximation? And how do I quantify a good approximation? If I have to send fewer coefficients, that means I can send things faster and I don't take as much bandwidth to do so. So let's go back to the uh, vector analogy again. So how good is an approximation? So let's say we have this vector f and it's got three components to it. Those components are found through a projection, which is usually an inner product or a dot product. And let's say that I want to approximate it with um, a vector which only uses the x and y components. So I'm truncating that series at n equals 2, if you want to think of it that way. Well, the way that we would quantify how good an approximation is, is how big is the error? And in the vector sense, we have this error vector e, which actually has a length to it. Um, so the size of the error vector, or the magnitude of the error vector, is just well, the magnitude squared actually, is just the dot product or inner product of E with itself. So that gives us a sense of how good the approximation is. 
what about for signals? So let's say we have this signal f of t. So what we are going to actually do, and this is an important concept, um, not something to memorize per se, but an important concept is one way we can find these coefficients is to take f of t and project it onto each basis function. And this is effectively an inner product for functions. So if we truncate our series at n and we get some approximation f of t, well, how do we find the error signal? Well, we just subtract. We subtract um, f tilde of t from f of t, and that gives us the error vector, or in this case, the error signal. Okay, so how do I measure how big that error is? Well, if we go back to our projection or inner product, we just take the inner product of E with itself, just like we did with vectors. So effectively, what we're doing is we're taking the integral of the square of the error vector or error signal. Well, what is that? We already looked at that in the time domain. That is effectively the energy in the error signal. And if you think about it graphically, what we're doing is we are taking this signal and squaring it, so everything is positive now, positive valued, and then we're integrating it. So we're finding the area under the curve of E squared. What if we have finite information? The information that we need to approximate f of t are just these coefficients which we can also found from, find from that inner product. Well, how many do we need? Well, this is again where engineering comes in. What we do is we set a tolerance. So if the energy is power, uh, or sorry, power or energy is uh, uh, the integral of E squared, then what we do is we choose N such that the error energy is less than some percentage of the total energy of the signal F of t. So we know what signal we're trying to send. We know how much energy it has. We know what the error signal will be if we truncate things. So we basically just keep adding terms, a1, a2, a3, or keep, keep increasing the size of the approximation until we've got, for instance, 95% of the original power. And that's some way of measuring um, how good an approximation it is. And then once we've got to 95% of the power, or in other words, when the error, is, error energy is only 5%, then um, that tells us how many coefficients we need, and that defines how much information we need to send. Okay, so this is where we start to get into the frequency domain. So now we're going to focus on a very specific set of basis functions, and we're gonna use sinusoids. Okay, so in the time domain, our, the basis set we typically used was impulse functions, because that was the most general one we could use. So now we're gonna take a look at using successive frequencies of sinusoids to approximate f of t. And this is something that you've already done back in your math class last semester, and that would be the Fourier series. And we call the decomposition by impulses, we call that time domain analysis of a signal. Decomposition with sinusoids, we call frequency domain analysis.